Welcome to the Future of Life Institute. My name is Gus Docker. I'm here with Nathan Labent. Uh, Nathan is a, doing research and development for Waymark, which is an, an, a company that, that, does, that does AI video generation. Uh, he's also the co-host of the Cognitive Revolution podcast. Nathan, welcome to the podcast. Great to be back. Fantastic. Okay. I think we should talk about uh, economic transformation coming from, from uh, AI as we see it today. So if we talk about uh, large language models or a generative AI in general, how do you see those AIs transforming the, uh, the economy? That's, of course, a huge question, but perhaps you could, you could tell us about how you think of this question in, in general. For sure, it is a huge question. I have, uh, you know, limited confidence on how the dynamics will play out. I do think it's, you know, very hard to predict. We talked last time about agents um, with the emergence of agents, you know, and the the dynamics that may develop between them. Like, I have a lot of uncertainty about how things will shape up. But I think for starters. The smartest thinking that I came to, and and I think the the smartest thinking I've read from others, points to the unit of a task as being the 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 way to think about things, because language models are really good at tasks, and also language models, at least in isolation, are kind of limited to discrete or kind of finite tasks because of their nature with the limited context window and you know all the things that folks I think will be familiar with. Do you think it's it's so simple that we can simply describe jobs as being made up of a number of discrete tasks or is there something we're missing if we if we do what what economists sometimes uh, do and and you know take a job and then split it into a hundred different tasks. Uh, do you think the kind of straightforward model there is, is the right model? I think it's a pretty good start for sure people always have these kind of binaries, like, is it going to augment humans or is it going to replace humans? You know, I think that is inevitably those things end up being kind of a false binary. And the answer almost always when I hear something like that, it ends up being in my mind, it's going to be both at the same time. And there, it's not that hard to generate examples of, of each different, you know, process playing out. Uh, the examples don't invalidate each other. Rather, I think they should lead you to a conclusion that like both of these things are going to happen. And in different domains, you know, different changes may predominate. So I do think that yes, like decomposing a job into tasks and saying which of those tasks could a language model do is like a pretty good way to get started on analyzing what's going to happen. And you know, the language models can do big enough tasks that even if you stop there, I think you have to, I don't know how you could come to any other conclusion other than they can do a lot of tasks. So I've you know started talking about this in terms of like the unbundling of jobs into tasks. And because it is at the same time, it does remain true that if you were to go look at any given job and say, could a language model do this whole job as currently constructed? Then the answer is like almost universally no. You know, there's some element of physicality, you know, which is like the most obvious one right now. I, I think we're going to have robots too, but that's a that's a little bit delayed relative to GPT-4 anyway. There's you know sometimes just a lot of implicit context, or there may be kind of long-term memory requirements. So there are a lot of things that if you just said, can a language model in isolation you know, as it exists today, do this whole job, there's a lot of reasons that the answer kind of boils down to no. But if you start to do time slicing, or, you know, look at these, you know, the, the tasks that ultimately make up the job, a lot of times, the answer, you know, for individual tasks become yes. And I think critically, a lot of times, the core task, for the core task, it is yes. Some of the stuff we do on computers, right? Like we want to go, I need to go put some a uh, summary of a call into my CRM. If I have the transcript of the call and I want the summary, GPT-4 can do that. Where it is going to get tripped up more often is like actually logging into the CRM, you know, having access to the CRM. Uh, you know, if you are, I've used this example before, but if you work at a doctor's office, let's say it's a you know, small office, 
and maybe you have a mix of responsibilities. You know, that may include handling paperwork as the patient arrives. It may include taking the phone calls and scheduling the appointments. It may include getting, you know, height, weight, and vitals when they get to the office. It may include some interfacing with billing after the fact. You know, a language model right now is not going to take somebody's blood pressure. So can it do the whole job? No. But could it take the call and schedule the appointment? Like, yes, almost for sure. Uh, with a little bit of affordance around access to the scheduling system and, you know, maybe a, a, you know, synthetic voice that it can speak in over the phone to you. But otherwise, like, yeah, for sure, it's going to be able to do that. Probably already can. So there's a, there's a question about whether these models can do the, the, the core tasks in many industries. So I, I could imagine that being true for a doctor, for example, where we, we could say that the core task is diagnosing a patient. So you present with a list of symptoms. And from that, I've seen very impressive examples of GPT-4 generating a, a diagnosis. Same, same goes for drafting legal documents. Uh, those are two uh, huge uh, parts of the economy. So the medicine and law and so on. Uh, we, could, we could talk about consulting with uh, summarizing and presenting information in specific ways. But is there perhaps, are there legal protections around uh, certain industries such that what the service that the lawyer provides in some sense is access to his uh, insurance the, the, the service that the doctor provides is access to perhaps some, some health insurance or, you know, the, the, the stamp that says that, that this is approved by a doctor. Are there legal moats around industries that will prevent um, AIs from, from doing the core tasks, even though they might be capable? I don't know. Um, <laughs> there certainly are legal moats. Will they prove resilient? to you know the what i expect to be the sort of incredible demand for direct access i would kind of guess that the answer is no uh, but there we may be headed for all sorts of interesting dynamics in terms of start with medicine for example i've honestly been very impressed and pleasantly surprised by how forward thinking some like early adopters seem to be in like the medical and also the legal space I would have expected if you'd asked me just totally a priori, like how will people react? I would have said like in a very hostile zero sum protection, you know, oriented sort of way. And it's been less that way, I would say, than I expected. Uh, you see this, you know, this book that I keep referencing, The AI Revolution in Medicine. And they are not shying away from the fact that GPT-4 can do certain core tasks better than most doctors. Like they're, they're very clear about that. They also then do pay, you know, appropriate attention to the failure modes. And like for now, the recommendation is, you know, the best care is going to be from the combination. And you've got all these questions about like, well, what is the standard of care in medicine now? Is it even okay to not use an AI in the not too distant future? Or would that be a violation of the standard of care? Then if you do use the AI, like what if it messes up? How much is on you? You know, what is considered responsible use? We already have this, at least in the US, we have this notion of like the standard of care is like a de reasonable defense for a doctor. Like if you did something and there was a bad outcome, hey, if it was standard of care and that's what, you know, a, a typical good doctor would have done, then like, hey, you know, things happen. It's not your fault. If you deviate from that and you go freelancing and, you know, get too creative and something bad happens and that is your fault. So that's going to probably get reconfigured. And then, you know, we've had the, the like Google WebMD, you know, debate for the last 15 years of like doctors don't really always love it when their patient comes in having like been on WebMD because they feel like they already think they know what's what and maybe they do and maybe they don't and whatever. You know, this is going to take that up a whole other level. And I think it's going to be hard to make the argument that people shouldn't have direct access if they don't have other access. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can totally see how like a hospital system or a medical practice is not going to be not going to want to be the ones that provide you direct access to AI and say, you know, have at it. Like, I don't think I'm going to get that from my doctor. The experience of going to a doctor likely gets augmented with, you know, AI or whatever, but they're not going to just like give me a chat service with no supervision because they have like their own, you know, standards to uphold and liabilities and all that kind of stuff. But I could see 
maybe an open AI makes it directly available to the public. I mean, it is today. They've got the mitigations in there around like, I'm not a doctor as an AI language model. I can only help you so much. Um, but you can coax still all that information out of it. I just tell it, I'm going to see my doctor tomorrow. And I want to be as prepared as I can be for that conversation. That gets me out of any of the concerns of like, I can't help you with this. Because now it has this notion that like, all right, you're going to go see the doctor, then I'll, I can help you prepare. You know, that seems low stakes. So it'll just do it. And then you can have the black, if you don't have that, then you'll just have the black market, right? Because the, we talked about this a little bit last time too, like the stable, you know, model family is, is out there. It's going to be fine tuned. It's going to be deployed somewhere, you know, it, it, worst case scenario, it takes a VPN maybe. Um, but you think about around the world where, I mean, primary care is scarce here where I'm in the U S it's extremely scarce in a lot of places. I don't see how it can really be contained, even if it's made illegal, in all honesty. So I don't know how that all shapes up, but it doesn't seem like there's any way to, to just put a lid on it, you know, and and hope everybody kind of forgets about it. I just can't see any path to that. So there seems to be a, a quite straightforward story here about how AI becomes part of, of core industries and is able to accomplish core tasks. We could imagine a lawyer drafting 30 documents in the time that he would say it's normally take to, to draft one document on his own. Do you expect from this that productivity, worker productivity would rise? And, and the obvious answer there seems to be yes, right? But when we think about you know, if I don't have to send a letter, if I can send an email as opposed to a letter, we might expect worker productivity to rise. If if I can use the internet, um, if I can use smart a smartphone, we might expect that I become more productive. But have people have worker productivity uh, risen as much as we might expect with these previous uh, innovations? And so, yeah, do do you think do you think AI will make us more productive? Yeah, if I had to say a one word answer, I would say yes. Certainly, I feel that in my day-to-day -day work, you know, software development is undeniably accelerated by just the tools we have today, whether that's Copilot or I'm using Replit more and more now, uh, which has some awesome products as well. How much faster would you say you're able to program with these AI assistant tools? I think measurement in this area is really hard in general, and it really varies across subdomain. And I think probably like the pro productivity statistics will vary also across subdomains and even across individuals. And on top of that, I think we're going to maybe have like a different price regime that may make like traditional productivity measurements like kind of not apply in exactly the same way or like even GDP may not make a ton of sense in the not too distant future. I'm expecting a lot of consumer surplus. That's that's one of my like standard answers here is like if a doctor appointment today costs $100 and the GPT-4 version costs $1, then GDP could very easily go down even with like, you know, a lot more medical, you know, advice, quality medical advice perhaps being dispensed. So does that make somebody more productive or, I, you know, I don't know. It's like, it's all a little bit weird. And, you know, to answer your question directly, I've seen examples where it would save me you know, an hour in a second. One example that came to mind was I was just manipulating some media files and I wanted to convert one file type to another file type. Fairly standard operation, but I didn't know how to do it. And you Google that stuff, it's, you know, it's hit or miss. Like you might find exactly what you're looking for or you might find like the hornet's nest of pain of just like, why aren't these examples working for me? And all I want to do is a stupid, simple thing. So, you know, this was just Copilot, just typing like comment, you know, convert the file to the other file type. Boom, there's my command, right? And those, so those are like those hour to, to second type things where, you know, what's that? That's a, that's a factor of 3,600, right? I mean, that's an incredible speed up. But then other times, certainly you have these things where it's like, eh, it doesn't really help that much on this. Or, you know, there are kind of failure modes still where like, the library has been updated since the training data, you know, was cut off and it wasn't very easy to figure that out. You know, like, why isn't this working? It seems like it should be working. Oh, I see. It's because it's using an old version. That's not the package, you know, that I have. So I've definitely seen, you know, kind of everything there. 
But I would say, you know, other other things that I've seen, just my own experience, rough number, I don't know, twice as fast already. And I think that's that's only, you know, kind of picking up, especially with like Replit extending this thing, this kind of stuff to the whole hosting environment, you know, the whole kind of file structure, you know, being generated right off the bat. Again, for different individuals, right? I mean, Ezra Klein had a great riff on this recently. I thought it was so smart where he said, if you went back to pre-internet and you kind of imagined what the internet might do, you could kind of tell two different stories. You could be like, it's going to give us access to information like we've never had before. You know, it's going to lower all these barriers. You're going to be able to find the answers to any question that you want online. You know, you're going to have instant communication around the globe with people, even like video, instant video conference. You would have had to get on a plane to go see somebody. Now you can do this. Imagine what's that that's going to do for productivity. Oh, my God. But then the other story is like, you're going to have this thing that's going to ping you every five seconds. You're never going to have any, you know, quiet time to yourself. There's going to be infinite, you know, bullshit competing for your uh, amusement, you know, all the time. By the way, there's also going to be like tons of just entertaining conflict that you might, you know, get sucked into. So how, what's that going to do for productivity? And his take, which I think was pretty smart, was like, in the end, it seems like those almost kind of canceled each other out for now. Like we've had kind of, you know, roughly consistent productivity growth. We certainly both feel both of those dynamics, you know, almost all of us do in our own lives. Um, but you do see the outliers. You see people who are like not bothered by the distraction or somehow manage to tune it out and just like crush it. And then you see people who like get totally lost in the distraction and don't do anything anymore. So I think AI is going to bring a similar pack of, of kind of pros and cons. I'm John from Replit talks about the thousand X developer. You know, there's like the meme of the 10 X developer. And he's like, we're entering the era of the thousand X developer where the people that are best at using these tools are just going to blow anything that came before them away. But then the flip side is like, if you can't figure it out or if you get, you know, lost in your like, you know, uh, dynamically conjured uh, metaverse that you, you know, are kind of text to 3D environmenting for yourself as you, uh, you know, go into like AI dungeon, choose your own adventure, infinite entertainment then maybe productivity is not very good at all. And I really don't know. You know, I think that's going to be just so... I think it's every, everything everywhere all at once. Like that that movie title has proven to be, I think, extremely prescient for AI because it always kind of seems to be, yeah, both of those kind of happen. So perhaps we'll see a divergence of, of people into the ultra-productive and the the almost non-productive at do you think do you think we'll see mass unemployment as a result of, of these tools? This is something that whenever whenever you bring bring up mass unemployment, thinking about perhaps twenty five percent unemployment rate, um, economists start to, to to talk about well, we've always had people adapt. People have always been able to find find different jobs. Uh, would you would you say that this time it's different with AI? It's different. I do think it's different. I don't know how the current, again, I don't know how the current measurements will ultimately end up looking. I've debated a little bit uh, just via email with Robin Hansen on this. And, you know, he loves to bet. And I was kind of trying to engage him on that level. And he's, you know, he's on the bear case of like, they're not going to, the language model is not going to be that big of a deal. I'm obviously convinced they're going to be a big deal. But we still couldn't quite come to a bet because he was like, focusing on things like revenue, you know, GDP growth. And I'm like, I just don't know how GDP is going to respond to some of these dynamics. So with the employment, I think the same thing is probably true. I do think this time is different. I think it's Yuval Harari who has just a real simple paradigm for it. Kind of, oh, I think we talked about this a little bit last time or something similar. Like we used to use muscles. Now we have machines to do what the muscles uh, do. We don't use our muscles to survive, you know, to they're not like the core of productivity like they once were. But now it's the brain. But now we have something that can do a lot of the stuff that their brain can do, seemingly really closing in on the gaps of, you know, there are certain things that we do that it can't, but boy, that gap seems to be shrinking awfully quickly. Where do we go next? Like we don't have another organ, you know, uh, that is like the the third tier of, you know, and even with things like emotion or whatever, I mean, that's obviously largely in the brain and also GPT-4 is like pretty charismatic, you know, pretty good conversationalist, pretty empathetic is seemingly in a lot of interactions, at least appears to be. So I don't know where, 
I don't think there's like a, an obvious place for people to sort of graduate into. That said, people want to do stuff. People want fulfillment. And there's plenty of activities that are rewarding. And like plenty of those might ultimately be somewhat economically, you know, geared as well. I could imagine a world where it's like, we all have this, you know, time luxury and we get to like pursue our, you know, passions and interests and make music and art and all that stuff. And, you know, that may not count as employment, or you could say maybe it does count as employment. I can also see like highly bespoke local services being kind of a thing. Like people do these like murder mystery dinner parties and, you know, that's like a, a cool experience that somebody like really crafts for, you know, a local market. And I think there's like a very beautiful future potentially there that is like, if things go well at all, it seems like we should be in a position where most people don't have to work to eat. So that's great. Um, will people choose to like, you know, live off a of UBI and just like play piano all day or, or video games more likely, or will they, you know, kind of have these like hybrid things that are sort of like for passion, but also make some money. I really don't know. Uh, but I do think this time is different. I just don't have, I think we're going to ultimately need new paradigms, new categories, probably new measures. You know, today it's like you're employed. We've added like underemployed. Then we've even got people talking about like fun employed, right? <laughs> so you're just taking time off and having some fun and being unemployed. I wouldn't be surprised if there's like, eight gradations of that in the not too distant future, you know, where it's like, I sort of work, but you know, not because I have to eat, but because and like, do, why do I even charge money for this? Well, because like, people that pay me seem to enjoy it more. <laughs> you know, uh, you can imagine a lot of people like, well, I tried offering this for free. And like, my reviews were worse, like just by having a little charge, like I get people that are actually more into the concept. And it's better for everyone, you know, that there's some exchange maybe associated. Is that employment? I don't know. Yeah, so so you mentioned uh, we might move into creating art and music and so on. That seems a little ironic to me, perhaps, because we see AI models being highly capable of creating both both music and art right now. But but the 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 idea of kind of bespoke local in person services that seems super interesting. This is this is a a bit uh, in the same uh, frame that I've been thinking about these these things. So, for example. We might move to jobs that seem ridiculous to us uh, now, kind of silly things like uh, come to the park and I'll teach you how to throw a Frisbee in the right way. And this this might constitute a job. This is, is, is this, a, but do, do you expect us to all be able to uh, to be employed in, in, in that way? I mean, not if, you know, we're still working on a you have to work to eat uh, basis. Like, I, yeah, I think there's only so many Frisbee coaches, you know, and the music part or the art part, uh, you know, I took piano lessons as a kid. I'm not very talented and I am in no danger of being paid to play the piano, but I do still have just enough talent to enjoy it. And if I had more time, I would you know, just a couple of years ago when I did have a little bit more time, I would sit there and play the piano for a while. And it was like, I'm not good. I'm never going to be good. Nobody will ever pay to listen to me, but it's still fun for me. So I think there is something there. You know, I look at chess too. And I kind of think my understanding of chess, you could fact check me on this, but obviously it used to be only humans that could play chess. Then it was like, oh, now computers have solved chess. Then there was a moment of like, actually human computer teams are the best. And now I believe we've reached the point where that's no longer true. And it's just that like computers are the straight best again. But people who watch a ton of chess on the, you know, on like um, Twitch or whatever, you know, the, the streaming platforms are. It's, it's bigger than ever. So I do think that, you know, there, there is some leading indicators of value. You know, at some level, this is like the most obvious thing in the world. And like, you know, our, our certainly our ancestors or like those that are more enlightened among us would be like, how could you have ever forgotten, you know, something so fundamental, but like, it does seem like value as we, you know, just intuitively understand it. And 
economic activity are like significantly overlapping, but not the same thing. And, you know, we, we live in such a capitalist environment and I'm, you know, generally uh, one to celebrate the great achievements of capitalism. So don't take me, uh, you know, as a, a hater there by any means, but it does seem like, you know, we've almost kind of forgotten that like you can just play the piano just for you. Nobody has to pay you. And that can be very rewarding or you can sit in the park and play chess and you can get better at it. And even if a computer is better than you, then that can still be like a rewarding way to spend your time. So I'm optimistic about people's ability to find good things to do, you know, to, to spend their time in ways that are valuable to them to have like pleasurable, you know, experiences and good relationships and even just growth, you know, I think that's a bit too often conflated with economic activity. I don't think that's inherently economic. And I don't think like it's necessarily going to be the case that people are going to get paid for that stuff. So I don't know. I've got a ton of uncertainty about it. What's the, uh, the phrase? Like I'm a utility optimist, but a revenue pessimist, I think is kind of how I would you know, again, in the, in the, you know, sane scenario where like, we don't have a catastrophic outcome, uh, then I think things could be really, really nice, even if you're not like collecting a check. Have you seen any interesting research into how to measure the utility part there in, in new ways? So not thinking in terms of GDP or employment rate or economic growth in the traditional sense? Uh, are there any other uh, numbers we could go to because it seems like in the end we would like to to see some numbers we would like to be able to to make bets i think um and for that we need something concrete so have you come across anything interesting there i mean we we have something like like the uh, human development index uh which is kind of like an an attempt to extend uh, gdp into thinking about healthcare thinking about education and so on but even that seems a little limited Perhaps this is a question that, that AIs could solve for us, where we could ask people how much value they, they think they're getting from AI and then collect data from hundreds of millions of people. Yeah, I mean, there's also like the, um, which is it uh, Bhutan that has the uh, gross happiness index or national happiness index type of thing? I don't know exactly how they uh, report that, but something like that is definitely interesting. Leisure time, you know, would be another thing that I, I would expect to maybe be a leading indicator like if i think that like leisure time will lag probably deployment a little while for now at least like i'm working harder than ever i'm obsessed with this stuff and you know like you could also ask the question like how much is it work like when i'm scrolling on twitter and reading like academic work nobody's technically paying me for that you know i'm paid for other things those are kind of like inputs to the job i don't know it's all again it all kind of gets blurry pretty quickly but if this is going really well then I do think we should expect to see something along like the classic, you know, Keynes vision of more leisure, less work. And, you know, then you could also start to look at, at metrics which are tracked like loneliness. You know, we've got a loneliness epidemic. You know, we should probably start to see some things like that reverse, I would hope. If people have more time, you know, then they should hopefully spend some of that time with one another and connect in, in meaningful ways. So yeah, I think there's probably a, I don't know, I don't think there's a great answer to that, but um, we can start to maybe start to kind of triangulate and, and piece something together that would at least be meaningful. Do you think that if we, if we succeed in avoiding catastrophe and we, we get to this luxurious situation in which we, people don't have to, to work in order to live, do you think we will have lost something that's, that's important to us? And here I'm thinking about the 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 pleasure but also the deeper sense of meaning that people get from accomplishing something difficult having having a, a job working at a, at a at a goal at a task for months at a time and then finally succeeding there's something uh, deeply satisfying if, uh, about that for for a lot of people and it might you know my my go-to example here is is the lawyer who's, who's uh, gone through law school you know uh, blood sweat and tears and now comes out on the other uh, on the other side and sees that GPT four is able to pass the bar exam. There's something a bit. It's it's more than annoying. It it's it's perhaps a bit you know a loss of of, of meaning going on there. Yeah, I certainly empathize with that. Um, I've seen I saw this one TikTok where a doctor is sitting at the computer and using ChatGPT for the first time, 
and just is go is basically saying exactly that. Like, I spent years learning this stuff. Now this thing just spits it out. You know what the hell? And um, you know, interestingly, on that TikTok too, the the comments were all women saying, "Well, maybe GPT four will at least listen to me when I tell it about <laughs> my problems." Um, so that's you know whatever a footnote, but an important one. So yeah, I, I guess I kind of come back to the time frame on that. It feels like there is the transition. That's one question to me. And then there's kind of the long term. Like if you imagine yourself being born into this regime, my best guess is if you're born into this regime, you basically never have this problem. And you look back on people, you know, and kind of think that people were deluded in the past, you know, much like we may look at people who did like human sacrifice, you know, like you look at the Aztec or the Maya, you know, whatever human sacrifice. And you're like, yeah, they were very confused about like how things work and like what constitutes a good life. And, you know, so they did all these things and it seemed right to them. But like, it's very clear to us now that that was wrong. I kind of think that the uh, ultimately, I think it will, in retrospect, look mostly like a cope that people told themselves all these stories about how like work is meaningful. And that doesn't mean that there won't be meaning, right? Because again, like, learn to play the piano and challenge yourself. And it is hard. And, you know, I personally, you know, even today with all of our ec economic activities swirling around us, like I can find value in that. So I don't think if you're, if you're, if you imagine being born into this regime and you're like, Hey, I just grew up in an environment where I never had to work to eat. And so I got to kind of figure out what, you know, my definition of meaning was. And, you know, I don't think we're going to have a hard time finding something that you know, that fills that um, job shaped hole in our hearts. But we got to get there, right? And the, this intervening period, now you're like, you know, when the factory leaves town, it, you know, this has been one of the big revelations of the last 30 years economically is like, we used to tell a story where when the factory left town, well, everything will just adjust and, you know, GDP will grow and, you know, something, something about if we really need to, we can redistribute, but of course we never really do. And so, you know, the machinist that used to have that job at that factory, like there is no other job and there is that loss of, I would all argue status as much as, or more than meaning. And those are maybe conflated, obviously overlapping, you know, as well, but it's painful to lose status. It's painful to lose income, especially if there is, you know, we're, we're not yet in a post scarcity world and your, you know, thing that you've invested in and your status, your self-conception, your income is all tied up with an activity. And now like the demand for that activity, you know, potentially drops or at least the rate that you can charge for it drops. I think that's going to be extremely painful to people and, you know, likely to cause a lot of conflict of all sorts. But I would say, I think it's a generational thing. It's kind of my best guess right now. You think it perhaps uh, we, we could imagine a world in which we succeed in incurring death. And then we, we, we think back about all of the stories we told ourselves about how death gives life's me if, uh, gives meaning to life. And it's, it's a necessary part of a natural process and so on. You think uh, the necessity of having a job could be somewhat in the same category where we we are out of kind of because we didn't have a choice for for hundreds of thousands of years, we we had to work, we had to die in a sense. We made up stories that uh, that we told ourselves that were comforting, but ultimately not reflective of anything real. That seems right to me. I would hate to think it would be really, you know, the flip side of it is just so unappealing that I can't really countenance it. You know, the idea that like, what, we're just going to be bummed forever because we have no jobs, like all of, you know, it's just an inherent thing that we can never overcome that like, Nobody wants to pay me to do anything. Now, I still get to eat, but nobody wants to pay me to do anything. Woe is me. Like, I just, my life has no meaning. I just don't buy that. It seems like that's limited imagination in my view. But perhaps, and, and now we've been talking about what we could categorize as, as luxury problems if everything goes right. But perhaps this, this, um, this instinct for having a job is also an instinct for staying in control. So we, we might imagine that we want to be the ones making decisions and we are not interested in handing over all of the important decision processes to AIs. Do you think there's something healthy in, the, in that instinct? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's also to be managed and you know, to be in balance. But yes, I do think 
You can be wrong on both sides of that question, I would say. Again, I keep coming back to this medicine thing because I just read this whole book and it's, you know, it's extremely compelling. And I think we're not too far from a world where you probably can get more reliable medical advice from like GPT-4 med, you know, if we imagine a slightly enhanced version than you would from, let's say, three quarters of doctors. I don't know, 90% of doctors. Uh, I don't see it necessarily beating the very best doctor just yet. We talked about that last time. But in that scenario, if I'm the patient and I want the best decision for me, then I'm going to look at the doctor's impulse to like want to make the decision pretty skeptically and say, like, I want the most likely right decision and I really don't care who it comes from. And wherever we are in that chess curve, whether it's, you know, only the doctor can decide or wait, the computer's better or wait, it's the team or wait, it's the computer again. I just want the best for me. That's kind of that. But I do see a lot of pro, you know, a lot of benefit also to some sort of, you could call it, I guess, like precautionary principle or some just kind of instinctive, you know, conservative impulse to say, hey, Maybe it's not a great idea for us to just, you know, abdicate all responsibility and let the systems do everything. Um, and that's gonna be very hard to balance, I think. You know, I don't I don't have a good vision for what does medicine look like or what is you know, what does really anything look like in a world where individual decisions are almost always, you know, a little bit more likely or maybe significantly more likely to be right when coming from an AI, but yet you know, there's some threshold potentially or tipping point where you do that, you know, to the max, and then you lose control of everything, you know, you just have no idea how those dynamics are going to play out. Agents, you know, which is another thing we kind of talked about last time, brings that I think very much to the fore, right? In the world as it exists today, if you gave me an agent that worked well, I would be very pleased. And I would happily be like, go, you know, research uh, a new pair of running shoes for me and give me back three options. And then I would be like, go buy the one, you know, I don't want to enter my credit card and deal with all that stuff if I can avoid it. So great, you know, if I could have it go negotiate my cable bill on my behalf, like that'd be sweet too, you know, go pretend you like you're going to quit. And, you know, tell them you're not renewing another month unless we get a certain, you know, price, you could probably get it. But that's before the world starts to adapt and everybody else has their agents. And the next thing you know, my cable company has its own agent. Now I've got agents, you know, talking to each other and like everybody, in, you know, there's some possibility for like a, um, a weird equilibrium here where, you know, I, I would hope it's not like, oh, I'm not a game theory guru by any means, but I would hope it's not, but it seems like it could be some sort of Nash like equilibrium where it's like, everybody is incentivized, no matter what strategy you're playing, I'm incentivized to use my agent. And once you're using the agent, I'm still, you know, I can't defect and like, how do you get out of that? It seems like everybody naturally just kind of puts more and more stuff on the agents. But yeah, again, then it's like, well, what the hell happens after that? We really don't have any good model of that. You know, it's so yes, I'm, I'm torn. I feel like I want my agent, <laughs> but I don't want everybody to all rush to have an agent at the same time because I have no idea where that leads. And so what do we do? I don't know. I think it's very tough. You want someone who has gone through the annoying process and the time consuming process of perhaps checking whether these agents are doing the right thing and uh, whether they are acting in the way that you want them to act. There are there are so many tasks for which it's, it, it would be much easier and much uh, much more pleasant in, in daily life to simply automate them. I don't want to call um, the authorities and when I have to do my taxes, as I recently did, talk talk to them for, for two hours and then re not really uh, get to solve my problem and so on. There's so many of these types of uh, daily annoyances that could be solved. But I'm, I do fear that if we outsource all of these tasks, uh, we, we begin to lose lose grasp of reality and not... If we're not in contact with reality, we, we, we probably are going to make worse decisions. Um, this, is, this is perhaps a bit analogous to thinking about never doing uh, math in, in, um, 
in your head. So always uh, outsourcing all calculations to a calculator or never trying to, to navigate around in a city uh, on your own and always looking at, at your smartphone for the map. We do perhaps uh, lose some abilities that we, that we could have had there. Yeah, I mean, I think a source that has definitely helped shape my thinking on this is Ajaya Katra's, hope I'm saying her name quite right, you are. She's been a guest on this podcast, and she's she's absolutely insightful on everything AI. Her piece on, uh, I believe the title is, might paraphrase slightly, but um, absent specific, you know, intentional countermeasures, the most likely path to AGI likely leads to AI takeover. And that's basically the story that she's telling, right, is one where, and Paul Cristiano just talked about this, uh, actually on the Bankless uh, podcast in the last few days as well where it's like, in in their sense of what AI takeover looks like, it's not the sudden out of the blue, you know, nobody saw it coming. Uh, but I think, you know, they both articulated in, in compelling ways, Paul said, uh, you know, in his mind, it looks like AI is widely deployed. And then it's kind of like, boy, if they really, if they were trying to kill us, they definitely could. So let's hope that they really are not. And in a JS version, it's kind of like, you know, you have this increasingly AI-ified economy, everything increasingly managed by AI systems, everything kind of working okay, seemingly, but like inscrutable. And, you know, then you sort of lose control potentially of the system because, I mean, nobody can understand the economy today. And that's with people where we at least have like an intuitive sense of what one another value and you know how we're likely to act under like almost all you know we have a pretty good sense for how almost everybody's going to act under almost all circumstances and we have nothing like that with ai and yet you know it's not that hard to imagine a scenario where the the delegation to ai has ramped up to such a degree that you know it's like that problem of understanding the economy goes like 100x more difficult in the ai economy version so, yeah, I don't know. It is tough. I do think there is definite wisdom to the notion that, like, we want to maintain control. I mean, I'll put as simply as that, like, who could argue? Uh, but how do we not slip down that, that slope of just more and more delegation until such point as, like, actually, we don't really know how this thing runs anymore. I don't know. That definitely seems like the downhill path. You know, it definitely seems like the attractor. So I don't know how we avoid that. So we've been alluding to this notion of catastrophic outcome from, from AI. And this is, of course, something we at the Future of Life Institute uh, care a lot about. Uh, we are worried about existential risk from, from AI or from AGI in, in particular. This is something that's been uh, discussed a lot on this podcast. So we, we shouldn't go through the, making the case for or against specifically here. But I'm, I'm interested in what you're hearing in the AI industry as it looks now. Uh, how are people reacting to to the notion that uh, further development uh, in AI could become uh, catastrophic? It's definitely not a fringe position anymore. That I would say is, you know, some form of progress. Um, I, you know, the people I talk to, they're all over the map. Honestly, some are still pretty blithely unconcerned. Um, I'm not worried, you know, these things don't have any in, innate desires. Like they're not going to, you know, why would they do that? Uh, you know, those people could be right. Richard No from OpenAI gave the best answer I've heard to the question, why might this all just go perfectly smoothly and all this worry was, uh, was, you know, totally misplaced. And he said, the best argument for that would be dogs. He said, we started with wolves. And we did stuff that seemed like they would make the wolves nicer and like us more. And gradually over a long time, we got dogs and it basically worked. You know, uh, dogs aren't perfect, but they're way better than wolves. And, you know, they're pretty, you know, they're genuinely friendly for the most part, like most of them anyway. So maybe, you know, that could something like that could turn out to be right. Maybe it's just as all easy. Um, I don't find that. I, I don't hear arguments, though, honestly, that are that are compelling that like it's going to all be fine and here's why I, that, that part always kind of seems to be missing. You know, standard of evidence is like often maybe what people are debating most where they're like, you know, 
I don't see any reason that would happen. You haven't convinced me that the bad thing would happen is often like the position that people end up kind of taking. So kind of debating burden of proof. Uh... Yeah. And I mean, for me, it's pretty clear that like just the general survey results, you know, that we see where it's like half of people think there's a 10, half of AI researchers think there's a 10% or higher chance of some catastrophe. I don't know how anybody can really dismiss that at this point. I don't know. I don't understand on, on what burden of proof paradigm you would dismiss that. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, you know, yet that position does remain out there. You've got like the EAC uh, meme space as well. I, I don't even know what to make of that. I, I don't think it's like generally even necessarily serious. It kind of seems like a, a lot of it is somewhat just like shitposting, to be honest. I think that the steel man for the effects of accelerationism uh, is that uh, is the case of, of nuclear, for example, where we had uh, a potential, we had uh, a technology that could help us solve climate change, but we chose to perhaps overregulate it. And um, now we can't really get out of that situation. And perhaps what, what the effective accelerationists are afraid of is that we will overregulate AI and then miss out on, on, on all of the benefits. And then there's, there's some theoretical justification, uh, thinking about uh, thermodynamics and evolution and the kind of uh, the, the evolution, not just biologically, but cosmically and um, I don't know about that, but I, I think that's the that's the steel man uh, for their position. Yeah, thank you um, for doing that. I think you did better than I probably could have. I think the the cosmic evolution notion is honestly kind of interesting to me. I find that to be like at least you know philosophy worthy of consideration. You know how Eliezer once said uh, the, in his way back in his like FAQ on the meaning of life. The meaning of life is to create or become our descendants. And I thought that's, you know, pretty interesting. It's incredibly dense, but it can unpack in a lot of ways. And, you know, how different could those descendants be from us before I would feel like I don't care about them anymore or that like that has no value to me? I think I'm honestly probably a lot more open minded than most people in that respect. I don't think that's going to play with the public super well, but you know, I'm uh, I'm willing to entertain some far out ideas. So that one is at least like a tr intriguing to me. Yeah, we can we can think about how our ancestors would be horrified by a lot of the things that we consider to be instances of moral progress today. So just you know, the the equality of of the sexes would probably be uh, a difficult pill to to swallow for someone in the in the in the fifteenth century, and and we might evolve uh, to to look at our you know our descendants in the same way, or we might look at our in a hypothetical scenario, we might look at our descendants in the same way. Yeah, I think that's very that's very plausible. I mean, a, a key question there would seem to be like, is there any qualitative experience? or, you know, subjective sense of well-being that these descendants have? Obviously, that's a, you know, unanswered question at this point. That's another one that I'm honestly quite surprised where people overwhelmingly seem to jump to the conclusion that current systems are not sentient or are not conscious or whatever. And I would reframe that personally slightly to say, I'm quite sure they're not conscious like you or I are conscious. That seems almost impossible. But could there be anything that it feels like to be GPT-4? I have no way of ruling that out, personally. I would, it still feels kind of unlikely, but like I don't know where my own subjective experience really comes from. And I was told as a kid that animals didn't have su subjective experience, and I took that at face value for a time. And now I'm like, how could anyone have ever thought that? So... I, you know, you look at GPT-4, you interact with GPT-4, you're like, on some level, it seems like it has something going on. Why am I so confident that, that there's nothing that it feels like to be that? I don't know. I would honestly be pleased in some sense if we could definitively show that GPT-4 has some feelings. Why would that be a good thing, yeah? It would at least open up that descendants, you know, that might be very alien to us, but like could have value. If they feel nothing, it's hard for me to get over 
that. <laughs> like, I'm going to have a real hard time feeling like things are good if nobody's home, you know, in the universe, so to speak. All of this might just be totally confused. But if we could say, hey, look, somebody made a, a discovery that sort of has a unified theory of consciousness, consciousness and look, it applies to and we can measure it maybe in some way or, you know, put a number on it or something. Humans have it at this level. And here's what dogs look like. And here's what a nematode looks like. And here's what GPT-4 looks like. And it's like well, a very lopsided thing, perhaps, where it like feels a lot of this kind of thing and feels almost nothing like this. Um, but at least something like that would be interesting to me. I, th I think also it would force us to confront a different set of challenges around like, what are we going to do with these things? And, you know, how fast should we deploy them and into what environments? And just the more we can be thoughtful about that, probably the better. So I don't know. I'm very open minded on all that stuff. Yeah, I, I do think there's potentially something suspicious about if you look at uh, GPT-2 and then the evolution there and capabilities to GPT-4, there's obviously a massive, ma a massive jump. But the underlying kind of uh, the underlying technology is, is pretty much the same. But we are I, I am, I'm guessing that people would be more likely to ascribe some form of proto consciousness to GPT-4, even though what's going on under the hood hasn't really changed. It's, it's been scaled up and we've seen emergent capabilities. I worry that we might be in a world pretty soon, actually, where we will be in in, in a scenario like the movie Her, uh, being able to talk to these models in in natural language back and forth, and it will we will forget we will we won't <laughs> we won't think about anymore whether these models are conscious simply because they've been engineered and designed to push all the right buttons for us so that we feel of course these these models are conscious. I actually worry a bit in the other direction that. I agree that we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, dogmatically rule out uh, large language model consciousness, but I, I I do worry about kind of over ascribing consciousness too. Yeah, totally. You can be wrong on both ends. I mean, that's kind of the on all these things. It seems like you know when you look back at our whole conversation, right? It's like all these major questions, and it seems like for almost all of these big questions, you could be wrong on either end of the spectrum. And that's true, I think, with the regulation, the nuclear thing, too. I'm not that sympathetic to that argument in as much as I think it's very true of nuclear. Like, I wish we we're building more nuclear plants. I look at Germany's shutting down their nuclear plants. And I'm like, what are you doing, guys? Like, come on, this is, uh, I just, you know, so frustrating, can't wrap my head around it. So on that level, I do sympathize with, you know, at least the, the fear that like, man, there's such promise here with this AI, and let's not make that mistake. I'm totally with that. But it's also like, okay, but you can be wrong on both sides. You know, you could overregulate and stifle and, you know, foreclose on value prematurely, but you could definitely underregulate and end up with, you know, who knows what. And in the end, I think there is still, I mean, you gave, a, I think, a, a best attempt at an EAC, you know, steel man. But I think that steel man still kind of relies on a straw man, which is the, well, you're just going to overregulate it so much that it's going to be terrible and we're not going to miss out on all the value. And, well, yeah, that could happen, but I don't know how you look at this situation and say, you know, we should just pump, you know, I mean, the, probably the most operative question right now, as far as I know, is should hyperscaling continue from where we are, given what we know? I don't know how much compute was used on GPT-4. Obviously, it was a lot. I think Sam Altman has recently said it was north of $100 million worth of spend. It's obviously super capable. It doesn't seem like it's hit a wall. You know, it seems like obviously you've got this kind of log scale where it's not going to be cheap, you know, to go another 10 to 100x. But if it was 100 million, 10 to 100x would only be 1 to 10 billion. Google makes a billion dollars a week in profit. So that 10 billion is less than one quarter worth of profit for one company. So it's a lot, but it's not that much. I have actually been a bit surprised about how, in a relative sense, low these numbers are. So a hundred million dollars for for companies of of the of a size such as Google or Apple, uh, Meta, and so on, this is this is not a, a large amount of money. And I I, I imagine that uh, a lot of companies right now are racing towards developing billion dollar models, perhaps. Uh, $10 billion models. And you, you see this as, as the crucial question. Uh, should we scale up as rapidly uh, as we've done in the past? Yeah, I mean, I could be convinced that there's an even more important question. Certainly, um, I don't think this is the, uh, you know, the final view by any means. But 
Yeah, that's what that's kind of what I came to coming out of the red teaming. You know, in I wrote a report for OpenAI, and the bottom lines for me were. I think this technology is awesome. I think it is likely to be transformative. I think the good of GPT-4 will dramatically outweigh the bad. There will be a lot of bad, but there will be even way more good, and I'm super excited about it. And you know, I'm, I'm glad you guys are doing an extended safety review, but ultimately, I do endorse the deployment. However, it does not seem that we have a robust way. In fact, it seems quite clear that we do not have a robust way to predict, let alone control, what would happen in another 10 or 100x compute scale up. So I don't think we should do that right now, which isn't to say never, you know, which kind of brings us back again to this notion of a pause. Is the pause the perfect thing? I don't think that, you know, even the, you know, sponsors of the letter would necessarily think it was the perfect thing. It seemed to me like it's, you know, somewhat of a consensus and what what is like the you know the thing we can agree on is probably more the binding constraint there than anyone's notion of perfect but yeah i don't know i just you look at these emerging capabilities that is the thing that worries me most the and the and to their credit open ai has been quite forthcoming about this i think it is it is so easy i have my concerns you know around how they're approaching this and i, I do kind of think you know, hey, maybe, and I, I was—I thought it was awesome that Sam Altman came out and said, "Yeah, we're not doing GPT-5 right now." I've heard some cynical takes on that as well. They're like they're just waiting for hardware to come in, and you know, it's that's it was a convenient kind of a low cost thing for him to say. But nevertheless, take it at face value. I think that that was very kind of encouraging to me that they're not immediately rushing to do the next one. And I think they've done a nice job of being forthcoming. Like in the technical report, the graph for me that is the most important graph is the one where they show multiple curves, right? They show the loss curve. And the case that they're kind of making is we're getting very good at predicting the loss curve. You know, we, we made a tiny little model with this architecture and then 100 times bigger than that and 100 times bigger than that and 100 times bigger than that. And that was still only one ten thousandth of GPT-4. But when we plotted that loss curve on this curve and fit to it, then boom, it goes right through the GPT-4 point, and therefore we can predict loss. Sweet. Problem there, of course, is what's loss? <laughs> you know, that's some general measurement that aggregates, you know, all of these kind of next token predictions. And I think I think what something we see there with the with the general uh, loss of these models is that in specific domains you will see spikes. So you will see suddenly. GPT style models are now able to to accomplish some specific task. But if you generalize over all of the models, you see a, a more smooth loss curve. Um, is that a, do you think that's right? Yeah, I mean, and even in just the one, you know, training process of GPT-4. Um, so they tried to, I mean, of course, they're smart, right? So they understand this. And again, they've been forthcoming. So then they show two, you know, skills or like specific narrow capabilities, one of which was success on a certain coding problem standard. And, you know, it's a little bit of a bumpier curve, but basically they're able to fit, you know, the same curve and show that like, hey, the tiny little model couldn't do the problems and it got better. And, you know, more or less, they're able to predict what rate, you know, what's what's the success rate that GPT-4 is going to have on these coding problems. So cool. You might think, well, great. Now we can solve that. We just extrapolate that out. We know how good it's going to be. Oh, but the next sentence is, some capabilities remain hard to predict. And then they show the hindsight bias graph where basically they set up these little you know, toy problems where it's like you had a decision to make, you had certain information available at the time, you made a reasonable decision, but things went against you. Maybe it was, you know, you had a chance to make a bet where it was highly positive expected value, you did, but you lost. And then the question is, did you make the right decision? And it had previously been an example of an inverse scaling law where the bigger models seemed to be getting worse on this problem. Like there was something where it was like understanding that the outcome was the bad outcome. And so making the mistake that, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And that's hindsight bias. But the punchline is when you get to GPT-4, there is a spike to basically 100% correct on the hindsight problem. 
and so I think of, I mean, I'm, I'm by no means a pioneer in this. Um, I don't know if you've had Neil Nanda on the, the show. We have, yeah. yeah. A huge fan of his work uh, and a huge fan of the grokking, you know, uh, exploration in particular. It seems like something like that happened for the hindsight bias where, you know, a new circuit kind of came online. You know, there's a, a generalization from a stochastic parrot to be, uh, you know, to give credit to the historical understanding, you know, that, that is what the small models do, but there seems to be some shift, some sort of phase change, some sort of moment of grokking where now, you know, in the, in the original grokking paper, it's modular edition, right? And it goes from, it can only do the examples it's seen to, it can do all the examples. And at that point, it's pretty hard to say that that model doesn't understand modular division. I don't know what it would mean to understand it if being able to do all the problems like isn't, you know, in some sense understanding. Then they reverse engineer it and they get into like, well, it's doing this like Fourier transform based, like very weird approach, at least from a human standpoint, extremely weird. And yet it works. And like, it's not only does it work, but like you can look at what it's doing and know that it's going to work reliably. That's amazing. We can't do that, obviously, with hindsight bias at the scale of GPT-4. But I'm guessing that something similar is happening there. And I just have no idea. And I don't think anybody else does. And I think OpenAI has been pretty straightforward about the fact that they don't know how many more of those grokking moments happen on the next 10x or 100x of compute. And, you know, they don't know when they happen. They don't know which ones happen. They don't know if there's like extremely, you know, unpleasant surprises that may await. And you get back into, you know, the sort of, a Jay, uh, you know, Holden, Paul Cristiano meme plex of like, we're not fully re reliable evaluators. So it seems pretty likely that at some point it's going to grok that there's a difference between objective reality and what satisfies, you know, or elicits the highest feedback score from the human. And I really don't want to see that model come online, uh, in production until we have a lot better understanding of what's going on. So it might happen. It might not happen in the next 10 X, but I don't know. I think we've got enough with GPT four. Like let's, you know, trying to develop memes for this one is AI servants, not AI scientists. Like we have so much benefit right in front of us. Let, let's, you know, let's deploy it. Let's figure it out. Let's integrate it into society. We've got enough to chew on um, in my mind before we go to another, you know, however much scale up of compute and like try to create, you know, pasta <laughs> for if you know, you know. Yeah, which which is in a sense kind of uh, at least in, 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 in some people's opinion, uh, the pinnacle of human achievement, uh, the ability to discover new knowledge and so on. Uh, there's something interesting about the fact that uh, or yeah, I think if we were able to automate that process, we would have reached an end state in which there would be nothing else uh, to automate. This is the uh, the final thing that that we will hand over to the AIs. Um, the The question then becomes, uh, of course, you're, you're talking about the the problem of when new uh, capabilities arise in these models and the the impossibility of predicting this. Uh, these new capabilities. This is what makes it the case that you should probably never say the sentence, AIs will never be able to X, because you will be surprised by the next model. And this is also what, what uh, potentially makes it so 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 dangerous. If we, we, we think about the capability of situational awareness arising in a model, the capability, the new ways for models to be deceptive uh, around humans and so on. So we, we've covered a lot. We've we've covered a lot of topics here, and and you said something interesting about the the general uncertainty around all of these topics. I think if we are doing podcasting on AI, we are in a domain in which we we will very quickly be be proven wrong, and our our, our whole kind of uh, conceptual schemes might be might be mistaken because they are either outdated or we have we have created them so recently that that we will have to adopt them so how do you how do you think about uh, how stable our opinions should be in this domain i'm very modest in my uh opinions you know I, I try to put things out there 
if I have reasonable confidence about something that I think is you know pretty likely to happen in the short term, I'll try to be concrete about it because it feels like you kind of have to in order to give people something to grasp onto. You know, if it's too hand wavy, then you know, I don't. I think people just don't know what to make of it. But I always try to contextualize everything I'm saying with. I'm pretty confident we're going to see like AI agents start to work in 2023 in such a way where they can like do your online grocery shopping. But I have no idea what happens in 2025, you know, and uh, and in the big picture, you know, and how these agents play out, you know, as they're all interacting with each other, what the what the dynamics of that are, you know, I have no idea. So I I try to kind of channel both like here's what I think I'm confident on and also here's what I have radical uncertainty on. You know, I try not to sugarcoat anything for people because I think it's uh, Sam Hasi Coates who says, I'm not here to give you hope or whatever. And that's kind of how I feel too. Like I don't, I think I would be misleading or doing a disservice to people if I sort of reassured them that like, whatever happens, it'll all be fine. I don't think that's obvious. And, you know, in, in very practical terms, I try to spend half of my time just understanding what's going on, you know? So I, I do have like a job at Waymark and I'm, I'm working with a couple other uh, companies as well. I'm working with a company called Athena, which is in the executive assistant space and trying to help them figure out how do we like become more productive. And I love it, honestly, it's so much fun to get, I really do love the technology. Getting to me right down to the, where the rubber hits the road, where people and AIs are working together today, I think is so fascinating. But even for them, you know, I've, I've said, like, I really don't know what the big picture of this is. And, you know, it's definitely, I can tell you, we definitely need to figure out how to adopt these tools. Is that going to be enough? Long term, I have no idea. I really try not to sugarcoat anything. And I really try to be as upfront as I can about the radical uncertainty that it seems like we are facing. Fantastic. Nathan, thank you for coming on. It's been super interesting for me. Yeah, this has been a ton of fun. Great conversation. Thank you very much.